All right, looks like the number is pretty steady and we may have people joining us as we go. Um, and again, thank you for coming. I'm Laura Thomas. I teach in the creative writing program at the Residential College at the University of Michigan. And our webinar tonight is entitled Love and Zombies in Literature, What Makes Genre Writing Literary? And I'm so happy to uh, welcome you all tonight. Um, while we're waiting for attendees to join um, and we're getting um, all set here, I'm just gonna launch a, a poll. It's a fun poll that's going to, um, you know, find out what kind of writers are joining us tonight. Are you a little bit genre? Are you a little bit litfic? Um, so, and I'm gonna allow panelists to vote. So fill this out anytime. I'll have it open for a little while and then I'll give us the results um, in, in a little bit here. All right, I'm just gonna give it one more minute since we do have some folks still joining. I'd also like to say that uh, we are gonna love uh, taking questions tonight. And the way you submit your questions is in the little Q&A feature down at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. So at any time um, during our conversation, go ahead and just put a question in the Q&A. Um, and we have, I have some questions for our panelists and then I'll take a break from my questions and go to your questions uh, as, we, as our conversation evolves. So just at any time, go ahead and put a question in and I'll take them in the order that they come. All right, looks like our number is pretty steady. So without further ado, I'm going to get started. Again, our webinar is Love and Zombies in Literature, What Makes Genre Writing Literary? Um, and I think it's fair to ask, like, why are we talking about this tonight, right? If Octavia Butler has made time travel literary and Jane Austen has made romance literary, and Margaret Atwood has made speculative fiction literary. I mean, I think if we can all pretty much agree that genre writing can also indeed be literature, you might be wondering why I've invited my colleagues and dear friends, Christopher Matthews and Avi Steinberg from the RC to join me in discussing the boundaries and the distinctions between the two, like what's the point of that? Well, for one thing, readers make these distinctions, right? I mean, sometimes I want the zombie apocalypse novel I'm reading to be a sweeping allegory of our modern dystopia. And sometimes I want my zombie apocalypse novel to just be a fun, exciting escape from our modern dystopia. Sometimes a zombie is just a zombie and that's the way I want it, right? And then by the way, when I go to pick out my zombie apocalypse novel at my local bookstore, I mean, what do I see? I see categories. I see a mystery section, I see a fantasy section, I see a romance section. And the fiction section is where I'm likely to find those writers I just mentioned, like Butler and Atwood and other literary genre artists, right? You know, you go to the fiction for the literature, right? What be it speculative or, you know, or romance. And so the fact that bookstores are set up this way means that publishers also make these distinctions, right? When it comes time to market and sell me my books. So that means that agents need to make these distinctions. They need to know what category your book is falling into when you submit to them so that they know what editors you know, to approach um, who are going to be a good fit for that manuscript, right? So this may seem obvious, but I think that a lot of writers, I mean, I am in this category, I will admit, I'd love to think that my work transcends, you know, genres, that it defies labels, that it's mine, you know, um, and that readers are just going to like get it or not. And, you know, that's, you know, I'm an artist and that's what it is. Right. But, you know, when it comes time to write that query letter or approach that agent or that editor and actually sell your manuscript, um, that's the point where writers like me and writers like you just may have to make a firm distinction between genre and literary fiction, right? And it may just not be obvious to us um, what those distinctions are in terms of what publishers, agents, editors, and readers, you know, see those as. So that's why I convened this panel. Um, I think we should just start our discussion of these boundaries and intersections. Um, and so the way we're going to work things is I'm going to introduce um, Christopher Matthews and Avi Steinberg, both teach in the Residential College Creative Writing Program with me. Um, and then we're going to hear um, our panelists read from their work so you know what skin in the game they have um, with this conversation and you can hear their voice. And then we'll just um, 
ask questions. All right, so Christopher Matthews is a poet, fiction writer, and sometimes scholar of 19th century literature and culture. In addition to his creative writing teaching, recent courses on monsters and monstrosity, ghost stories and hauntedness, detective fiction, and an upcoming class on apocalypse, hopefully zombies, sign me up, uh, focus on tropes often associated with genre fiction, but which have lent themselves to complex literary treatment while tapping into some pretty big social and political implications. A personal essay on such themes amid the COVID pandemic, um, and it's entitled, This Virus Has No Eyes, Telling Stories in the Land of Monsters, is forthcoming in a collection from U of M Press. And then Avi Steinberg is the author of three books of creative nonfiction. His most recent is The Happily Ever After, which is a first person exploration of the world of pop romance fiction. And as part of this project, he wrote his own romance novel, which was put out by Kensington, a major romance publisher. So welcome um, panelists. I'm really happy and honored that you agreed to join me in this conversation. I'm really looking forward to having some fun talking about this. And Christopher, do you want to start with just giving us a, you know, a little taste of your voice and read a, read a selection for us? Um, sure. Okay. So um, thanks so much for asking me to be part of this conversation. This is really fun. Um, I just thought I'd read uh, the opening couple of short sections from a, a story of mind that, a story of mine that turned into a, um, a story about witchcraft in a way that I didn't quite expect. Um, it was called The Curse Breakers. Um, so it's um, focused on a young woman named Vesna. Um, and uh, in the aftermath of the death of a, a child she's just given birth to named January. Um, and in the background is the, uh, is the sort of lingering idea that there are a series, a, a kind of a circle of stones um, in the field that her husband and some of the sort of male authorities around her feel are the source of a curse. Um, Vesna is suspicious and as the story goes on, we, we actually come to um, realize that she has some, uh, some powers that we might associate with something like witchcraft. Uh, so I'll just read for a few moments these first two sections uh, from The Curse Breakers. Um, and maybe I'll just say quickly too that one of the structuring elements here is a series of children visit her mysteriously um, and so the story opens with that first visitation and then we come back up and give a little bit of a, of a sense of context. The first child came at dusk, mute and gray as the woods themselves, chopping a little line through the afternoon's new snow with ragged boots. Fafa had seen it first through the window, said what sweet devil's this, Vesna watched until it disappeared into the shadow of the house. A moment passed, a shuffling, a knock at the door. A little more of the door's locking bolt crumbled away. A poof of bolt cloud floated off. It had become sick like everything else, useless. Vesna had begun tying an old ribbon of her mother's from the teapot around the door's handle a lock of sorts. But she untied it now and opened the door. The creature was five or six, crusted over, dirty, silent, muffled up in a cloak and hat too big for it, just standing there making a puddle beside Fafa's chair, watching them both with green eyes. Vesna decided to unwrap the thing and found it was a pretty little child even if its hair did stick out at frightful angles and its hands were sticky to the touch. She gave it a stool, brought it some broth, and after a few moments said, do you have a name? The sharp green eyes looked away. So she boiled stock, checked on the animals. One of the chickens was missing. In the distance, she saw the breakers, 
had pulled their lacquered coach up to the stones, a black ink drawing of a coach on the white paper of the field. Later, she sat with Pietri for a little, that's her husband, while she slept, while he slept, twitched, pitched around as though he were tangled in a cot on a ship in a storm. The breakers, for all their apparent busyness out there, didn't seem to be making any difference. Pietri was still sick. January was still dead. The stored grain was still rotting, filling the outbuildings with a terrible funk. She fell into an agitated sleep. She wanted to go where they had buried little, um, sorry, yes. She wanted to go see where they had buried little January, but the snow fell thick and the doctor had taken her boots. When she jolted awake and slipped downstairs, she found the child on Fafa's lap at the fire. He was asleep, but the scraps rustled happily in the corners. Vesna was not sure if it was really safe for the child to be so close to Fafa, was never sure what the old monster might do, but the child leaned against the old man's chest playing with a bit of yarn with a pine cone tied on the end. Vesna had made it for the baby, a kind of toy. The child looked at her. She was a little thing. She said, rat. Vesna looked at the floors, the corners under her skirts. What? She said. The child repeated with those eyes on her, rat. When Vesna didn't understand, the creature explained, you asked me my name. The morning before January was born, despite the all night snow, Vesna had been able to see the stones from her window, just sunrise nosing up among them, molten like an egg yolk on the end of a fork. Pietri had called them the stones with a sly grin and a squeeze of her hand, back when such things were both more typical and more, more magical, what they called courtship, as if the stones were some boyish euphemism for secret pleasures, something stirring under the worsted. But it was what his father and his father's father had called them too, and the stones were nothing but wretched, rough-hewn pillars, six of them, staggered in a wobbly circle in the far corner of the field, vaguely similar but hardly identical in height, like fingers, thick as a cow's belly at the base, tapering in a mossy sort of way up to the vaguely pointed tips. To stand in the soft and weedy center of their circle was to feel in the grip of something, even if that something was just the usual throb of loneliness. The farm had been Pietri's father's and his father's before him, and before that, who knew? The way the men talked the land had been nothing but weeds and beasts and demons. Vesna's own father had been a farmer too, a different sort, down in the valley. And in the fire glow of their little hut, he'd tell her grand stories about their ancient claim to the land, the way the soil was in them. Muds in our veins, he'd wink. And they were in the soil quite literally in many cases. But the all important deeds were all in Pietri's father's father's name and her own father's knack for kindliness and an evening parable or two might have indicated what was eventually all too clear, a substantial lack of the skills required to make the farm viable without going into monumental debt. They would have lost everything if not for young Pietri's odd susceptibility to the girl he'd seen from the cart. By giving herself to Pietri, she had bought her father another four years to pay these landlords off. Turned out all he'd needed was three to die. Vesna's mother had never been anything but a ghost. And because their hut didn't have rooms, let alone the kind of extra room you'd seal off just as a shrine with all mother's things just where she left them. Mother lived in the teapot on the mantel where Papa kept her rings and a bit of blue ribbon and a scrap of lace forever browned from her fingers. 
which was just as well because teapots with rings and ribbon and lace in them are highly mobile and the teapot sat easily enough on this new mantle, Pietri's, that is Pietri's father's father's. Pietri was a fool. She had been slow to see how essentially rudderless he was. Yes, he had his own hunger, but he depended on others for his thoughts, his firm decisions. With her threadbare dresses and half smile, she had commanded him for a while, but he was the world's fool, a fool for his father, the ghost of his father, his father's father, the doctor, the priest, anyone with a few ounces of power or pleasure to offer, anyone he wanted to consume or feared might consume him. In other words, anyone. It had been Pietri's idea for them to be married among the stones. Pietri thought of them as an inheritance, a sign of royalty. He'd shown them to her as a means of wooing. She would have loved to have been unimpressed, but she was a simple girl and just about as young as she looked. The priest had refused to step foot in the circle. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. That was amazing. <laughs> um, if you've joined us a little bit late, we are hearing our panelists read from their work. And don't forget that there is a poll that I'm going to keep open for a little while longer um, so that we know what kind of writers we have attending tonight. Um, Avi, would you like to share some work with us? Sure. sure. Um, my, my piece is a little bit different. It's, it's uh, less narrative, um, although it is from my, uh, my recent book, which is a uh, nonfiction narrative, um, but this is probably like the, not as much of a narrative piece it's in, in itself. Um, I think the only thing you need to know for this, uh, to set up this uh, little excerpt is, oh, this is from the Happily Ever After, which, which is, as Laura introduced, is um, my uh, nonfiction, narrative nonfiction, creative nonfiction, memoir, whatever you want to call it, uh, about uh, first person, uh, exploration of, of the of, of popular romance genre. And I, I wrote some romance myself. Um, and part of my process of writing romance or, or sort of be joining into that world a little bit uh, was, to, was to join various writing groups uh, informally. Um, and so uh, this piece that I'm about to read is, is drawn, uh, it's sort of a, uh, related to the, the, a writing, the writing group chapter, uh, one of the writing group chapters. Um, so I'll just dive right in. It's about fan fiction. Um, my writing group was opening my eyes, not just to new genres, but to entirely new modes of storytelling. Jana educated me about the world of fan fiction. Most of what she'd written for our group contained large elements of fanfic, she told me. Really? I said to her, your stories don't sound like fanfic. They're really good. I immediately realized what a rude thing I had just said. I tried to recover by saying, well, I mean, obviously I don't know anything about fanfic. Don't worry, she said, I'm not offended. I get that a lot. And anyway, you clearly do like fanfic because you like my stories and my stories are all fanfic. So I got news for you, you like fanfic. Jenna was one of the most omnivorous readers I'd met. In a span of say a year, she would read what seemed like an entire genre. Then she would write entire fanfic epics in that genre. I don't think you could really, this is a quote from her, I don't think you could really understand a genre, how it works, why it works, until you've written fanfic in it, she told me. In the past few years, she'd gotten back into paranormal. This was like probably around 2013, maybe. <laughs> um, and this is another quote from her. I like to go with the fads, with what's new, because that's where you're gonna find the best stuff. Sure, this means she reads a lot of boring paranormal, but it also means she finds a lot of the freshest work in the field. I'm a scientist, Jana told me. She worked in a biotech lab in Boston. People in my workplace are always reading the latest papers in the field. They have to. You cite what came before you. Reading the newest fanfic can be a little bit like that. It's building on what came before you, trying to push it a bit further. Fanfic feels experimental to me, like science. Jana got her start as a romance reader reading LGBT stories. 
Today, this is another quote from her. Today, you can do LGBT paranormal or LGBT urban contemporary or LGBT Western or LGBT historical anything. But back in those days when she was growing up, LGBT was the subgenre, she told me. There were scant offerings. When she was just a kid, maybe 13 years old, she recalled being, quote, desperate for anything remotely queer. Obviously, I was looking for L stuff, especially for gay black women, but it seemed easier to find books about gay white men. So I had to make do with that, she told me with a laugh. You work with what you've got. This was also the reason she'd begun writing fanfic. I'm not sure whether I knew it was even called fanfic at first. To me, it wasn't the specialized activity or something. It was just filling the gaps, you know, the huge gaps that existed in genres I was most interested in. The stuff I was reading was great, but it was missing the elements I was dying to see. So I just scribbled them in myself, in the margins, you see, basically. Uh, it was just like a natural thing to do. And when I found other people, I'm talking now about gay women who were doing this too, well, I knew I had to meet those people. Eventually she, like many, found her way to fanfic.net. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Uh, among the romance fandoms, there are some important ideological conflicts. Some fanfic com communities were still reeling, and this was again about 2013, were still reeling from the enormous popularity of Fifty Shades of Grey, which emerged directly out of the Twilight fandom. Uh, Twilight was the original story, and, and, and uh, Fifty Shades uh, was, a, was originally a kind of fan fiction out of, out of, out of Twilight. Um, there was controversy at every stage of that history, starting with the decision to, quote, pull to publish, as it is called, which means to pull the story from its free open source platform on fanfic.net, on fanfic the place where it, wrote, it first rose to its hit status, and to rebrand it into a book on the market with a price tag. Um, the post-publication bonanza of Fifty Shades brought a new wave of raiders from the publishing industry who tried to ransack various fandoms in the hopes of finding the next big thing, the next romance gold rush. For many in the fanfic community, this violated their methods and their cherished principles and their space. Or as Jana put it to me, it was deeply not cool. Before it was called Fifty Shades of Grey, the story as posted on fanfic.net was called Master of the Universe. Before E.L. James was E.L. James, she published under the name Snow Queen's Ice Dragon. But around the fandom, she was commonly known as Icy. The, the work of scholars like Ann Jameson have done a lot to shed light on this history, including the preservation of some fascinating archival documents from that era, such as Icy's, in retrospect, prophetic text chats with angst goddess 003, who I now refer to as angst goddess henceforth, uh, the well-known fanfic writer and guru. Like so many others, Icy had read and admired Angst Goddess for Twilight fanfic works of her own, notably Wide Awake. Angst Goddess had gained a certain sage-like status in the fandom, not only for her own fiction work, but for her vigorous articulations about what fanfic was and especially what it was not. The fandom's purpose to her was to maintain a space for storytelling that stood apart from capitalist transactions that was first and last an exercise in egalitarian sharing. Fanfic was supposed to be a place where of equal and mutual exchange in which the currency available to all was stories and only stories. But Icy had big plans. In a, in a text conversation, long since removed from the forum and later shared by Angst Goddess herself, Icy had this to say, this is a quote from her. Uh, this is again, the future E.L. James. Uh, well, don't tell anyone. I have visions of being interviewed by Time Magazine for revolutionizing publishing, end quote. This was before Master of the Universe became Fifty Shades and grossed $200 million in a single year. I see asked Angst Goddess what she would do uh, were, she, were her own fan fiction, the much-loved Wide Awake, ever to cross over and become a hit on the marketplace. Um, and this is a, a quote from Icy. So if HarperCollins came to you and said, we would like to publish Wide Awake, would you say no? Angst Goddess replied, I would say, fuck no. To this, the future E.L. James had this to say, hmm, I'm not sure if I would have that resolve. Unlikely to happen though. Uh, I was just getting the feeling, this is a quote from Angst Goddess, I was just getting a feeling you don't really care about the fandom as a community whole. That is your choice, totally. Uh, at another point, Icy quipped, 
I'm sure it's easier to take negativity from fans with a big fat paycheck. Ang's goddess had responded to that comment by saying, and this is a quote, negativity has its place. It stops us from monopolizing ideas that aren't totally ours. The ideological debates rage on in, in both economies, fanfic and romance, and they continue to grow in tandem, though not always in harmony. For me, however, the dive into the fandom was critical to my education as a romance reader and writer. It made me realize that in a capitalist society, the great author, the solitary genius of literary fiction was just another libertarian racket, or it could be, uh, become, or it could become that, wherein everyone is lured by the promise of success, but in reality, only a few individuals have any chance to tell their story. And when they do, it's winner takes all to the detriment of everyone else. Fanfic and genre literature, and romance especially in my experience, opened up new possibilities, a different kind of literary practice based on different politics. The conversation happening in those circles was far more progressive and creative and ethically serious than anything I'd seen in the awards and grants world of literary publishing in New York City, where liberal back padding replaces serious thinking about underlying structures of storytelling culture. Um, but of course, I'm a product of that culture too. And as much as I like to think that I was a hardcore egalitarian, a socialist, or maybe even an anarchist romancer, like the great angst goddess, I'm sure I probably had a little bit of icy in me as well. I'll stop there. <laughs> Avi, thank you for that glimpse into yep. the world of fan fiction. I talk with my students quite a bit about um, fan fiction and the need to rewrite or write own, their own stories, um, you know, that uh, capture, you know, who they are, who they want to see in their fiction. And I also like that you brought the vast um, subgenre categorization that, you know, go underneath the major categories that readers um, are familiar with. So thank you for that. Um, just so our panelists get a sense of who's joined us tonight, I'm going to end the poll <laughs> and share the results. Um, and it looks like we've got some, you know, folks here who might, um, you know, be lit fickers, uh, never written a story about love zombies or heroic acts with magical implements, 39%. Um, but, you know, if you add up the percentages of uh, writers who have done some romance and who, you know, done some speculative uh, or zombie apocalypse stuff, we've got our fair share of those as well. So um, that, that's, that's all fun. All right. So my first question, and again, um, for our attendees, please, if you have a question, pop it in that Q&A and I will um, pick it up and be happy to ask our panelists. Um, so I guess first I'll go from the literary end. Um, you know, when, when editors are uh, looking for literary works, I mean, what does that mean to you when you're embarking on a writing project or in your thinking, you know, what does literary mean to you in, in the practical sense, you know, that, you know, that publishers and editors may be defining it? Well, I'll just start with a, a quick thought, which is that, um, one thing it makes me think about is as a as a writer looking at when you're looking at journals when you're when you have a, a poem or a story or an essay and you want to find a good home for it you're often trying to find um you know usually relatively uh decent respectable top shelf uh publications magazines literary journals um, or at least a lot of us tend to find ourselves kind of going to those kinds of places. Um, and it's at least for a lot of those and the, kind, the kinds of places that I often direct my, my students to, um, for fiction writers, you, you will often see in the, in the submission guidelines um, uh, some, kind of, some kind of distinction um, about genre. And usually, usually what it will say is we're not interested in genre fiction, at least in my experience. Um, sometimes you'll find a, a more, maybe a more thoughtful way of, of suggesting what they, what they're looking for, but, um, more times than not, what they're, what the, the note from the editor will say is essentially, we're not, we're not interested. Um, and, and my, my basic way of reading that is that, um, I mean, these days, especially, I think over the last maybe 10 years, it's become especially true that I, I, I don't think... I don't think editors are saying, you know, don't you dare send me a story that has a witch in it or a vampire or a zombie. 
Um, but what I do think they're saying is um, some version of, you know, we want, we want stories that are nuanced and character driven, um, kind of driven, motored by a sense of what we might call psychological realism. Um, uh, so, you know, if it's a vampire, that vampire needs to have psychological complexity. Um, I think the flip side of that is, you know, accurate or not, or fair or not. My, my sense is there's a, a sense that um, when they say no genre fiction, what they sort of mean is they don't, they're not interested in stories that, the, who, where the, where the main goal is to kind of check off the boxes of, of a particular genre's rules. Um, they want to see something that's not, not kind of obeying a, a checklist or an algorithm that, that for some readers or editors, I think is what genre fiction might signify is, right. It's, it's not sort of, it's, it's, uh, it's actually constrained by a set of expectations and a set of rules versus a kind of unconstrained literary craft. All, all of that in quotation marks. <laughs> but I think that that's some of what I think is being gestured towards by at least some, some of those kinds of editors. Avi, do you have um, some yeah, thoughts on this? Sure, I, I think that that's a really good description of the, of, of the motivations and sort of like the lay of the land when it comes to the, from the editorial side um, and like how, how those kind of journals and that kind of writing defines itself, sees itself, wants to see itself. Uh, I think that's really very, very accurate. I would say there's, there's also sort of maybe another, I wouldn't say it's hidden, but maybe sort of an unspoken um, motivation. That is just to stem the tide of the massive tide of of genre fiction that I think they're, they're a little bit scared of, you know, I mean, it's just, it's, there's a lot, it's the huge readerships, huge writerships of, of genre fiction. And, and the, and they're a little bit scared of how many people would submit to them a little bit. And I think it's sort of like, it's a way of, it's, it's a way of gatekeeping basically. Uh, and there's, I think it would be, it, it's interesting to like, you can, you can get, you can get more specific, more detailed. What kind of gatekeeping is happening? You can you could have like a, a class and race and gender analysis of it. I think all those things are going to be true. But it, what it comes down to is that I think there is some sense of they just are actually trying to like eliminate certain writers from the from the from the, from the get go. Um, and I, I think it again. I think there's a, a way which you could be critical of that. I think there's a way of just being kind of curious about it, just being interested in how this works. Um, and 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 also like from a historical perspective, which we could touch on a little bit another time, but um, of a, how did we get there? Like how did, how did that, how did, what, how did we define the literary genre as, it, I, do, I do kind of see it as its own genre with its own rules, its own expectations. Um, and maybe, maybe the game is a subtler game, a, a more mannered game and all this, um, but there are rules and expectations. And so how do we get to that point? I think that's kind of an interesting question, but I think a lot of it is just sort of a, like a very hard gatekeeping thing that's happening. And I, so I'd like to then, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Christopher. Oh, just a, a quick follow-up that um, something that, that your great excerpt was also getting me to think about, and then, and then what you were just saying, Avi, got me thinking about this too, that I do feel like the, at least one way for me of thinking about the value of this kind of conversation is that we're partly thinking about just the way, the way that as readers and as writers, we may just, it, it may just, benefit us to kind of know these different languages so that we can kind of translate and we can maneuver among genres. Um, and it's not so much that, right, that there's needs to be, we're, you know, we're cert I, I certainly don't feel like we're here to, to sort of solve the question of what is the proper hierarchy <laughs> of sort of value um, or what should we be writing and what should we be running away from, but just rather that we want, we want to always be kind of aware of, of, of kind of the various sort of codes and languages of the different different kind of genre lanes and what it might, how, how do you kind of know when you're shifting from one to the other, what kind of effort might you need to make to kind of translate from one to the other, or or if not even not made necessarily maybe in your writing, but in your query letter, maybe to know how I need to sort of speak that a particular kind of language if I want to sort of show the ways in which I'm thinking about genre or I'm, I'm resisting this categorization so I can open myself up to this other kind of mode. But um, I, just, I just like how a conversation like this is kind of about just enabling us to be more kind of more mobile. Um, 
Yeah, and it's, it, I think it's really interesting too because these kind of conversations, I, I think you're exactly right that they sort of happen um, by, by virtue of necessity in things like query letters. And as Laura also mentioned with, with agents and publishers, at a certain point, you kind of just think you, there needs to be like a shorthand and a way of talking about what it is you're trying to, you know, propose to them and what they're going to be commissioning. We, we, need, we need some sort of shortcut in, in talking about these things. So, but what's interesting is that a lot of it really is a shortcut. And, and this is something I actually talk a little bit with, my, with some of my students um, about, um, I, I, we, we look at, I, I did this probably actually just with my, my first round. Uh, I don't know, I, it's also a little bit, I wasn't sure whether the students actually, actually wanted to have this conversation or not, but um, uh, I would bring in uh, some contracts um, from like some of my own contracts um, and also some friends of mine um, and also and some of the legal disclaimers and it just sort of some of the legal uh, conversation that happens around books um, and in, in my contract it says for my first book and actually for my subsequent books it says a memoir um, so the, the, the genre is actually written into the contract it's not defined in any way in that contract it's just supposed to be understood that I know what it is of course I know what it is because I'm the one who proposed the book but but we never actually have a conversation about it except for the legal department has its own ideas of what of what a memoir is because they don't want to get sued basically mm -hmm. so so a lot so a lot of the genre actually gets defined by by legal concerns and by um, and, and that ends up actually putting a lot of pressure on, uh, like on the edges of the genre and helps define it. But this isn't necessarily what's being, you know, as an author, I'm supposed, I, I have to think to myself, well, how much of this is, am I supposed to be taking in in terms of my own writing of this book and, and how I'm telling this story? Uh, in the end, it's a pretty minimal definition. And in my, my own publisher, it, it just so happens, doesn't actually put the genre on, on, the, on the cover, on the cover page. It doesn't say a memoir. Uh, actually, my last one, it does, but the, but the first two didn't say that. In any place, it didn't say a memoir. You could think, and some people actually did, that it's a novel. <laughs> um, and my publisher actually happens to be the publisher that had the famous, uh, the notorious fabricated memoir. Um, so this is something that they're kind of like, you know, that uh, the James Fry uh, memoir, Million Little Pieces, that was my publisher, and it was right before my book was commissioned. So like this this genre, like, uh, fluidity, if you want to call it that, is something that, that certain publishers are actually constantly towing the line with. So that really leads into um, my second question, and, and we were, we're already touching on it, but I actually just want to get a little bit, nail you both down a little bit more on terms. I mean, now that Avi and Christopher has talked about fluidity, when a publisher or an agent or an editor, you know, is working with genre, that's what they want to sell. That's what they want to represent. So Avi, you could talk to us about romance and Christopher, perhaps, you know, speculative fiction. Um, you know, what is, what does that mean in a commercial sense? Um, you know, if you're going to submit a romance novel or you're going to submit a work of speculative fiction for a commercial market, what are um, those editors, agents, and publishers looking for as far as you understand those genres? Christopher, you talked about like, you know, well, we don't want literary journals, maybe don't want a formulaic, don't want the checking of the boxes. Well, for a commercial work, what boxes are you supposed to check? Right. I mean, I'm not sure that I have a, you know, a super precise answer that will contribute to any kind of nailing down. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, and I'm, I'm thinking of this in some ways more from a reader's point of view. Um, you know, I'm thinking about one of, one of my favorite writers, Philip Pullman, um, uh, the writer of His Dark Materials, uh, The Golden Compass, or what he's, I think, most widely known for. Um, but, and I'm thinking about him primarily because he has, he has talked about the ways in which um, his, those novels have uh, historically been marketed as as YA um, and he's talked about the ways in which that that's not that's not that, that was not a a target for him as he was writing those novels he did not conceive of them in that way necessarily but that's how they sort of once I think they entered kind of the publishing pipeline that's how they ended up being kind of aimed at the marketplace um, so I think I think partly what I find myself what, what this how this gets my wheels spinning is thinking about um, I, I think as I think 
the sort of the question of genre starts to kind of crumble <laughs> as I put my hands on it. And I start to think much more about, um, I don't know, I start to think about book covers. I start to think about marketing machinery. I start to think about the ways in which, you know, you could walk in, back in the days when you could walk into Literati, you know, you could maybe, you could go, you know, you could go find a copy of Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale in a kind of really nice trade paperback edition in the fiction section. You Maybe you could also though go find maybe kind of like more of a mass market paperback edition of it over in sci-fi um, that would just have a kind of a different feel to it. The paper would feel different. The cover art would would telegraph different things about what you're, what you're to expect from that novel. Um, and theoretically that then sort of frames it for a reader who, who a reader who picks it up in a sci-fi section is going into it, looking for it to um, sort of scratch the sci-fi itch, which in some way, which you could say in many ways it does as a kind of futuristic dystopian parable. Um, but a reader in the fiction section who picks it up theoretically is, is expecting, um, you know, a kind of a, a nuanced, savvy kind of political fable that, you know, that sort of in some ways it kind of comes back to, to who, how the reader sees themselves in that moment of choice and consumption and then what they think as they're cracking open the first page. So um, I feel like that's just a completely a non-answer, <laughs> but that's what, that's what the question gets me thinking about, so. Abby, do you want to, to wait? Yeah, I don't think that was a non-answer. That was very interesting. I, it just has a note to the, the the packaging thing, which is so important. I think so interesting part of the, it's such an interesting part of this question because we obviously don't want to think that the packaging is this, it makes that much of a difference in the way the book is is read I mean, or received, but even just to how an individual reads the book. Um, but of course it does. Um, and some of it has to do with, with what, what Christopher is alluding to is literally the physical object of the thing and the, the, the paper and the, and, and, and the blurbs on the back. And I would say, I would expand that also to the kind of conversation that it elicits and what we expect um, that, that, that conversation to, how we expect that conversation to go. Who, who talks about it or what length and in what, what magazines, you know, how, how does it get taken seriously or not seriously? Or how is it, you know, marketed to, uh, to readers um, that's going to affect actually the way we read. It's a really fascinating question. And, and it's also an older question. Um, I, I actually just recently, I, I can't remember where this, where I saw this. So this is going to be very frustrating. But there was a, an interesting history of, of, the, of how Jane Austen went from being a contemporary, a contemporary author to sort of this like um, an author for, for posterity. And the, 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 the sort of middle step, or there's a few middle steps before, before that, uh, in between, you know, after her death and, and be, she, before she became like this great canonical author, where she was pretty much um, preserved um, and, and her audience was grown um, by becoming just a mass market paperback that was, that was you know, they slapped the cheap editions and, and, they, and they would sell them in, in, uh, in uh, train stations which is like a really familiar uh, mode of marketing for us. It's, it's basically the airline novel. And that's how, that's basically how Jane Austen like survived 19th century or a lot of it. And before she became this canonical early uh, or mid, mid 19th century, I guess it was. Uh, I, I should get those years right. Cause it's an interesting question, but it's somehow that's, this was essential to how she was received. Um, so the, I guess the point from that, from that perspective is that these things also sometimes have longer histories, you know, it's not, these things are, they're not necessarily done. <laughs> uh, a lot of books will, will, not a lot of books, but certain books will have a longer history and will evolve even um, in their packaging. So that's kind of an interesting, interesting part of this as well. I mean, it sounds like what you're both um, saying is that it, you know, maybe has less to do with the content and the structure and more to do with how the publisher wants to promote market, categorize it, you know, box it up and, and send it off to us. Um, and, um, you know, that touches on some of Avi's thoughts about that space of fan fiction being, um, you know, a safe zone or creative zone away from, you know, the capitalist, you know, structure that's maybe forming our notions of genre more than maybe readers, you know, realize, honestly. Um, I have a couple of um, uh, questions in the chat that 
extend this conversation into, um, you know, questions about how gender, race, and class intersect with, with genre. So I will just read um, uh, the question in the chat here. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to find um, where that was. Sorry. So I'm, I'm interested, this uh, attendee has said, in either of your thoughts on the place of LGBT representation in genre and literary fiction, both, both classically in something like Dorian Gray or in more modern writing. And again, I would invite you both to um, talk about LGBT representation for sure, and perhaps maybe race or class distinctions as you, as you would like. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Christopher Avi. Um, sure. Um, well, I mean, I, I think like the, the piece I read, for example, uh, I think gets at some of this where it's like, what you see is a, an organic, like a, the people get to decide a little bit uh, in fanfic. And I think this is, I think it does extend a little bit to romance and, and genre literature. It, and this is part of what I think is, is interesting about it is that it does, it, it does invite people to the, the people, right? To the mass of people to decide what stories matter to them and it's less gatekeepers. So I do think that like, there, there does seem to be, and this is, I'm, I'm gonna actually say, this is something that I mostly have heard of. This is other people telling me about this. I, I'm not an expert LGBT literature where it's at um, in fanfic or even in literary fiction. Uh, I do think that even from my, my experience just sort of as a civilian reader, I do think it's a little bit farther ahead in, in romance. Uh, I think it, I think romance is is often on the cutting edge of a lot of different parts of of not just publishing but literature, um, because it opens the doors faster and more people come in, and so I think that like whereas you see literary fiction like very very much trying to sort of catch up on represent questions of representation, uh, LGBT and also in other other realms. Uh, I think this stuff has actually been done for decades now in 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 uh, in romance, especially. Um, that said, I also think that it's 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 a complicated question because there's also the 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 you know there's like a a culture of gatekeeping within romance too, and you know there's 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 the traditional publishers and there's a whole ecosystem of awards and things like that. And those things have been heavily gatekeepered for years. But I think that those things also, the doors will fly open. They are actually already flying open in those fields. And I think the things are gonna change super quickly and much more deeply, much more dramatically. Um, whereas I still think literary publishing is constantly gesturing towards representation, but they, they can't do it because it's, it, it's not structured that way. <laughs> so I think when it comes to LGBT literature, it's never go, it's never going to quite actually feel like it's it, it's really entered the mainstream. Quite, I don't know, maybe not never, but I don't think it will quite the way it has in romance probably decades ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess I thoughts that I I hope are relevant, but I guess I have a, a couple of of thoughts, and one is about the ways in which, um, at least when I think about something like the 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 kinds of kinds of conversations I have with students, say in a, in a class where we're thinking about monsters and monster stories where we would read Dorian Gray. Um, you know, it, it does seem to me that, that there, there's actually quite a long robust history of, of say Gothic, Gothic literature, horror literature, um, stories focusing on forms of monstrosity being a, a really wonderful place to think about transformation, hidden identities, um, passions that are sort of not, are not legible to a kind of mainstream populace. Um, there, the, some of those, at least within that kind of the genres, I think of horror and kind of monster fiction over the last couple of hundred years, there, you could, I think, make a case that, that there, there's a genre that has kind of offered a toolkit for representing kind of other modes of being outside the mainstream, other kinds of modes of identity, modes of desire, modes of relationship outside the mainstream that I think is, is certainly deeply fun to, to talk about it and to think about the ways in which those kinds of stories are enabling um, sort of more, more people, more ways of being to be, to be visible. And you see that I think getting, especially in maybe the last, at least the last, 20 or 30 years, if not much more, you, you sort of 
really see the ways in which the, those tropes really get sort of picked up and run with as ways of as ways of really inhabiting kinds of style, sort of styles of self-presentation, kinds of identity um, outside a kind of an older an older notion of the mainstream or the conventional or the accepted normal. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I kind of I'm kind of thinking, you know, Emily Dickinson, um, uh, the sort of the, the 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 need for form. You know, after great pain, a formal feeling comes. The ways in which she thinks about form as a way of kind of containing pain, um, I kind of find myself wondering about genre as a way in which it can, at least in that example, you know, in some ways there's a kind of maybe a productive constraint, and it can give you the tools with which to um, render as fable or render as trope a sort of series of conditions or struggles or desires that other other modes, especially modes more connected to a mainstream marketplace are not, are not ready to render as legible. Um, the other way I think about it is just in the ways in which a kind of classic, you know, literary realism has all kinds of, has all kinds of class, uh, class implications. I mean, I think there's kind of an old joke about kind of mid 20th century literary realism, basically, you know, kind of being like professors at drink at, cocktail parties getting divorced from one another. Um, and right, and that's, that might be realism for, you know, if you're, if you're a professor in an English department in 1955, that might feel like that's real, that's, that's real life. But, but for how many other people does that qualify as the real? Um, and it may, and it brings me back to Jane Austen, I think in ways in which there's a you know, there's a kind of realism with Austen, a kind of classical realism you can return to if you sort of know, if you know enough to kind of understand the, 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 the importance there of certain kinds of uh, fashion or social cues or the, the sort of economics of marriage that Austen is pointing to um, that might tie her more to a, a kind of realist tradition. Um, but then again, for somebody, you know, who's completely, you know, coming at it from a, like a working class background, it's, it may very well not connect at all as real or as realist, but maybe, but maybe then it has value as kind of fantasy or escapism or a kind of a magical world of, of carriages and balls where um, that, that might as well be, um, might as well be speculative fiction about a, another fantasy world. So I feel like that, that distinction between what's realist and what's escapist at least may in, its, in and of itself kind of have class implications because it depends on sort of what, what kind of social economic reality <laughs> do you live within so that what kinds of representations are going to feel real or not to you. Yes, and I think one of the things that publishing and writers both have struggled with um, and have become more aware of how much of a struggle it is in the last you know, you know, 20 years or so is that those same professors writing those realism novels were the ones who had entree into the publishing world. And it's taken a lot longer for uh, other voices to make their entree and, and certainly many are still struggling to, you know, to, to break through. I'd love to follow up on a question about that, but I do, there are quite a few in the chat now. So I think uh, if it's all right, um, there's a lot more to say about that. We may have to have yet another discussion about <laughs> um, the intersections of class, race, and identity, um, you know, with publishing. I think that would be a fantastic conversation to, um, you know, to, to continue. Um, but let me go to another question from the chat. Um, don't you think that genres are being constantly redefined and disrupted? Primarily now because of the world of independent publishing, um, online journals, social media, and I'm gonna throw in fan fiction that's not in this um, questioner's um, um, wording, but um, that's certainly before us, and the ease of entry compared to back in the day. So that does also um, intersect with uh, my thoughts on um, entry you know, and who, it, who are the gatekeepers and how do you, you know, so it, is that being re redefined and disrupted right now? I think so. Um, and again, romance 
Yeah, I'm not, this isn't just because I happen to write about it. It's the other way around. I wrote about it because because of these kinds of questions. They're really it re romance often really is in the front of a lot of these questions, um, including sort of sometimes just the marketing and the technical questions. Ebooks took off. Why did they take off? It's because they're romance readers generally, um, because of the way they because the modes in which they read. But then the modes end up like this question. It's a very good question. It ends up changing, end up changing the way we read also. Um, so I think that. You, d you definitely see how 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 how, those, how these modes could could um, could affect the way we read. So, like for example, with, and I, but I also I also think that the the, the genre itself sort of invites that in, with romance especially, right? What you have is you a genre where happiness, right? The happy the happily ever after the H E A, which is the the principle of the genre. Uh, it really is a political principle. Right, and it's an American political principle: the the, the right to pursue happiness. Um, what makes it radical in with ro with romance readers is that it's this is extended mostly to women. Right, uh, it's mostly women's uh, genre, um, and so it's it's women, you know, defining um, and 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 uh, this this or, or sort of claiming this 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 right that has been denied for many many years, and and in, in, in within a community building that building that right. Uh, and enforcing it within that community. Um, so I think what that ends up doing is if you actually, if you, if you have that principle, um, it, the idea of it is it is a universal principle and it has to be available to everyone. Um, it's, it's easy to sort of to get out there and say, if, we're not, if this is not available to everyone, then we're not doing our job. Um, I guess you can say that in literary, sort of literary fiction world, but, but I, I think it's, it's, so, it's much more essential to the idea of, of romance. Um, and so I think they're constantly holding the, this principle up and trying to live up to it. Um, and I, again, because it's a mass market principle, a mass market culture, uh, I think they actually have the structural wherewithal to actually see, to make it happen. It really is a people's literature, it's a folk literature. And so th the structure is already there. The, the bigger question, I'll just say one last thing about that. The bigger question in, in a genre like romance is that when it's not happening, how does, why is that, right? It, then you actually see, well, there's really some gatekeeping happening. But as soon as you remove just a little bit of that gatekeeping, it, it just flows through because I actually think that there, underneath, underneath that gatekeeping there's already such a big, uh, such a big desire um, for these stories. And, and the other thing is that the, the, the fluidity between the author and the reader, right? Um, readers become authors very easily in romance and in other genres too. They're, they're constantly stepping up to become the author. It's almost like a certain kind of reading is so intensive that you, at a certain point you just become an author. Um, and there's something about that fluidity of, of, of authorship and, and reader, um, which is also very democratic and essential to, to, to genre like romance. Hmm. Uh, it's interesting to hear you talk about the uh, mass market and that uh, sort of uh, mission and goal in romance because uh, more than one of my friends who, you know, wouldn't really uh, read a lot of romance novels, um, especially out in public, mostly because of the covers being very, you know, either lurid or not something that they want to, you know, take to, you know, the park, you know, while their kids are, you know, it embarrasses embarrass them. And so the digital readers now, and speaking of Fifty Shades of Grey, this was a big thing. Um, they love having the digital reader because they could read Fifty Shades of Grey without admitting that they're reading Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, uh, out in public or even in the privacy of their own home. They may not want, you know, someone in the house to know that they're having this guilty pleasure of this sort of, you know, trashy novel. Yeah. Um, Christopher, do you want to, um, you know, speak to this question too uh, about uh, disruption I'll, in, in the marketplace? I'll, maybe I'll just say really quickly, um, I, th I think I think yes, <laughs> Th things are changing and always changing, and, and I think as Avi has indicated, the, the you know the history of these genres is also a history of sort of constant sh shifting and recategorizing. So the the what we even inherit as a sense of relatively stable genres is a product of actually a bunch of a bunch of movement, and I think we're we're seeing yeah we're we're still in the middle of, of that movement. Um, so I don't, I, you know, I think about one of my, one of my favorite writers, um, Shirley Jackson, who I think in the kind of mid 20th century, you know, was writing brilliantly and be, became a, a bit of a, of a, as I understand it, a bit of a kind of mainstream literary superstar. Um, 
she kind of faded away then after her death. And I think then got sort of more recognized as a, as a kind of founding mother of a, of a certain kind of modern horror because her, um, I mean, she has just fabulous, she has written fabulous novels and fabulous st t stories of psychological horror. Um, um, and now she's, you know, maybe in the last five or 10 years, she's kind of been kind of rediscovered in certain ways and has gotten a lot of new attention. And so now she's kind of back, but is this, a, you know, again, kind of a, a star of the literary marketplace, but in a different form. So, um, and then I was also just thinking about just my own, in my own experience, you know, if I, I think if, if three years ago, I, you know, if you had asked me, do I want to, do I want to teach, teach students how to like write really good stories about fairies? I prob probably would have said no, <laughs> um, but, and I don't, I don't know who's listening right now. Some of my students might be out there, but I mean, I've had at least a couple or three students I can immediately think of who have convinced me that stories about fairies can be, can be subtle, nuanced, incredibly moving, can, can do all kinds of things, can do all the stuff that any other kind of story well told can do. So I just even think about that myself as a, as a kind of an old dude um, and just the ways in which my students are also constantly teaching me what else, what else is possible, what else is worth making use of as a storyteller. Um, and I'm absolutely sure that, that, that they and writers like them will continue to make these changes happen. Well, um, speaking of fairies, um, that brings us to another great question in the chat. So Christopher, maybe you wanna field this one um, first, just sort of going off that. And we're past um, eight o'clock um, listeners and attendees, but we're gonna go um, a little bit later because we have some wonderful questions before us. So, um, you know, stay with us if you can, absolutely. Um, so here's an interesting question. Um, often certain surface elements like supernatural forces or animals, romance cliches, futuristic technology, et cetera, signal that a certain work is genre writing, whether or not it really is, mm -hmm. you know. Are there any similar elements that signal literary writing that are immediately recognizable mm -hmm. upon a shallow reading of a text? And so I guess, Christopher, this would be sort of like, well, what makes the fairy story then um, you know, what signals that this is a literary work? What, you know, how would you answer that? Hmm. It's a great question. Um, I mean, I, I, part, I, I often think that sometimes the kind of genre versus literary question in, in a really, really overly flattened schematic way kind of boils down to a kind of cliche versus not cliche. Um, Again, that's not to say that I'm saying that genre writing is cliche, but I think there's this kind of concern that um, that right. If you you know if you have a if you have a magical sword, <laughs> it it takes it takes more work for the storyteller to kind of push against that getting read as kind of as just feeling like a kind of bit of clip art you downloaded from the kind of the storytelling atmosphere because it's, it's just sort of too available, too, too known. Um, so I think some of it is, uh, you know, I mean, not, not, looking for, not looking that the story is trying, to, is trying to kind of elbow me and say, hey, did you notice there are fairies everywhere? You know, sort of the sense of how, how is the story hailing me as a reader? Is it trusting me to pay attention, to learn things, to notice things? Um, is it hailing me as somebody who's interested in the nuance? And not just interested in, you know, kind of like the CGI of oh my God, there's a fairy over there. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to go on trying to fig, find a more articulate and sophisticated way of saying that. <laughs> but I think it, it has something to do with, yeah, tone and how the story engages me as a reader and how it's inviting me into a complex world I'm going to get to learn about, rather than that it sort of has something to kind of it has something to kind of prove to me from the get go to sort of show off, uh, show off a bit of kind of a kind of a prop or a, uh, something that immediately signals that it's really, that it's sort of kind of too excited to demonstrate that it belongs to a genre. I'd rather be just kind of allowed to enter and wander. Great, that's a great um, answer. Avi, um, do you have anything to add to that? 
Um, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's good. That's accurate. I, I mean, I, I would also add, I, I think something that, that was like right under Christopher was saying also is it's worth pointing out is this relationship uh, to the reader and uh, the awareness. This is probably a signal of any kind, any way you're looking, anytime you're looking for a signal. Uh, in the end, it, it's, you know, uh, the writer is writing, the author is communicating with a reader, or with someone who they think is a reader. Um, and how are, how is that communication actually happening? Um, so there's a lot of, in that sense, there's a lot of different little signals. Um, uh, in what, one way is a sort of like craft signal that Christopher's mentioning of like, how, how are they gonna get to that sword? Is it something they could just drop on you and it would be accepted, you know? Or, or does it have to be worked towards in a, in a different sort of way? Uh, I think that's definitely one, one, one kind of signal. Um, I mean, obviously I, to me, I, I still think a lot of it has to do with the way it's packaged and marketed. Um, and like, is it a part of a series? You know what I mean? It, a book that's a part of a series is almost, almost always going to be considered a genre, um, even though it's not, it's not inherent that, you know, that it has to be that way, but that's the way it's done now. Um, so I think those kind of things in some ways are the strongest signal, but it is interesting to think about how it actually works in the prose, which I think is what this question is. How does the prose signal, signal its way there? Um, yeah, I think, you know, it also depends a little bit about how, and I'll speak to romance, how wide the lens is, you know, um, uh, is it, is it clearly, is it signaling that it's, it's a, it's a, it's a work of, uh, like a social, a social novel. It's going to be telling you about, you know, New York City after 9-11. And we feel like we're getting that a big picture take on it. That's, that may not be, it's not like romances can't start that way or sometimes do, but usually that's not actually how it goes. We really jump right into the character, right into the story and into the characters. Um, so, you know, I, but on the other hand, romance, and this is something I think is interesting, is, is, is one of the trickier genres. Because to me, romance is so baked into that, the genre of what we call the novel. Uh, it's it historically so connected to what the novel is um, that it's one of the, I think, one of the sneakier genres. You know, if you're, it, it's, it's cheating a little bit to be like, well, the, you have the sword and the dragons. Okay, fine. And clearly there you're dealing with sort of the old romance, but what we now call, you know, the, 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 the other kinds of genres. But if you're talking about like a contemporary romance, that's awfully close to what a lot of what we call literary fiction can look and sound like. So I do think that they're actually just sort of merging closer together. And I think they always have been, you know what I mean? I, I really do think that the, the part of the reason why there's such an explosion with, with romance novels today is that people are just rediscovering what, what made the novel fun and energetic, you know, in the, in the 18th century also. Um, but I think that the sort of literary writers um, are no, notice that and they know that that's where a lot of the energy is. So I think that they're writing you know, is constantly sort of veering in that direction. It, it's almost hard. You have to work as a novelist to not have a romance in, in your in your novel. It's not like it can't be done. Plenty don't do it. But there's always this thought of like, should there be like a love interest in story? And certainly in in, in rom coms and stuff like that, that's expected and demanded. You know, but but actually, it just in a lot of a lot of novels, it, it kind of has to be in there. Like, and when you think of like modernism, for example, where it's like the, the novel there is clearly going to be pushing against that and working. It's the anti romance. Even there, it kind of it, there's there's some. This, this, it could veer. I was thinking of Ulysses. Ulysses is not a romance, but it kind of, it could be. It is a little bit. <laughs> it ends It ends in a happily ever after of sorts. It's a bit of a complicated Joycean uh, happily ever after, but in some ways following the, for, following the Odyssey itself, which, which can be argued that it is kind of a romance in a way, but it's a love story between between Odysseus and Penelope. Ulysses too kind of follows in, in, in that, in that, um, in that tendency. So, I mean, there you have the de modernist work, but it's got a little bit of romance in it. So I don't know. <laughs> Readers are hungry for love. Yeah. You know, just yeah. about in every book. Um, and so some of what you both have commented on also um, is captured in our next question here, because both of you touched on uh, some of the nuts and bolts of writing, um, as well as, um, you know, thematic signaling. Um, and so this questioner asked, how do genre conventions such as plot lines and archetypes, um, and you both were talking a little bit about plot, um, but um, this broadens it to archetypes, function differently in more literary works? Do they require more originality or complexity, for example? Um, Avi, you, you know, kind of start talking about, um, you know, how a, a literary work maybe broadens the canvas a little bit, um, and you use the backdrop of 9-11 um, as an example. 
um, do either of you have more thoughts about how, you know, the sort of nuts and bolts mm -hmm. uh, structure and our expectations of, you know, character types, um, you know, how they function differently in a literary context? I mean, I would just say that, you know, when I'm talking with students about these kinds of questions, what, what we would more often than not would end up talking about would be some version of whether whether the story story is primarily driven by character or primarily driven by plot, um, and so very you know a very very kind of rough definition of the more literary would be that a story is going to be more about being kind of being in the service of the complexity of character and and the and the way that the character is sort of behaving because our job in the story is to learn about that character and what happens when that character kind of moves into the world and bumps against other people and bumps against certain kinds of problems and um, versus right a more a more kind of plot driven uh, approach where you might you know where a writer might be sort of excited about a certain kind of idea a certain kind of plot structure wanting to get this character from point a to point b because at point b they're going to learn this thing and then that's going to get them to point c which can also be be thrilling, um, and I'm I'm a, a sucker for um, a, you know a good adventure or or an intricate plot um, myself. But needing to be really careful there that it that the plot um, that the plot's not not the only thing driving that character. So you don't you never you, because you never want to feel that. The, the reason that the char these characters are moving around the way they're moving around is because the hand of the author has come in to say, well, now you need to go over here because I've already decided that X thing is going to happen to you over here. Um, but again, I'm not sure, as with so much of this, I'm not sure that's, that's kind of a, that's kind of the, the idea of, of literary fiction being more character driven, genre fiction sometimes having more of a tendency to be more more focused on on uh, putting plot in the spotlight but that's you know probably a really really hugely false <laughs> distinction and really just any good writing you know and in, in any really good writing you know, you don't want to feel like you're just watching the author move action figures around the stage you want to feel that the characters are really you know on the move under their own steam because they have desires and they need things. And so they're gonna bump into each other in different ways. So it's, I think in any case, even if it's a zombie apocalypse story on some level, I think you, you at least wanna produce for the, uh, for the reader the, the illusion that these are real people and that they're making choices about where they go next because they have complex minds and complex needs. Um, and not because there's a puppet master who's kind of poking them and making them move around in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would I would just only add to that that um, uh, I, it, again with romance the, the the genre requirements are super minimal. Actually, this is according to the Romance Writers of America, the trade organization. It has to have a central love love story. This is the definition of a romance, and it has to have a happily ever after. Uh, it has to. This is a non-negotiable principle. It's it's enforced. If you don't, if you do, if you violate that, then your readers will come for you. And like it's not a, not a joke. They're, that's it's over for you as a as a romance writer. It's a real violation of an agreement that, that between the between the author and the and the reader. So it's actually pretty serious. But in the end, it's actually also very minimal. It's a very minimal requirement because you could do a lot within those two within those two requirements. There's really a really a lot that you can do and a lot of crazy directions it can go in. And in theory, a lot of a lot of creativity and a lot of innovation if you want. Um, and if you're, but more importantly, if your readers want, and this is why I think the actual definition, the actual difference between literary and, and romance, let's say, or genre is, is just how much it's, it's not just plot driven, it's also reader driven. Like you're really, really concerned with the reader. Uh, not just concerned, but maybe even a little scared. You really want to make sure you make them happy. You want to make sure that they get what they are looking for. They're important to you. You want them to continue to read. And some of this you could sell is it's market driven. They're trying to make sure you sell your books. Uh, but I think that there's a sense in which it's also like you want to make sure that your stories are, are, are connecting uh, and they continue to connect with, with this readership like, as a relationship between the reader and the, and the author and the stories. So I think that the, the, the focus on, on a reader 
is in some ways to me the main difference and um, the main distinction. And, and the literary writer will say, and I think, again, I, I'm going to sort of characterize it a little critically because I think that there's something really great about the, the license of a writer. I say this as a writer, the, 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 the license to say, I'm just going to do whatever I want and I'm going to try to figure this out for myself. And this is my creative you know, output and this is my, um, ex my personal expression. Um, I think there's, there's room for that, but there's also room for which that's, it becomes sort of not just irresponsible, but pointless. <laughs> like, isn't it supposed to actually connect with people? Isn't it, it, it it's good to, to, to be kept honest in a way or to have that, that limitation put on you as a writer. Um, and I think, there, again, writ large, I think there's something ethically that happens when, when all writers are actually expected to do that uh, and to have that kind of relationship with their readers. It's sort of a, what I was alluding to with the thing I read that when you think of this structurally, um, it, it becomes a different kind of politics, but writ small as a writer thinking about what does the reader expect and how can I actually give them what they need while also doing the thing that I need as a writer. I think that's the tension that makes it interesting and, and specific to like a genre specific uh, enterprise. Yeah, that's great. I, can I just kind of say here, here and just think <laughs> in listening to Avi about, um, yeah, the ways in which I feel like I, you know, one of the ways in which I feel like I'm kind of horribly conventional is I, I feel like I do kind of, as a, as a teacher, I kind of feel like what I want my students to mostly do is to kind of be, you know, independent geniuses, just <laughs> writing completely outside the box, you know, doing their best to kind of live up to that idea of the author is just kind of radically free to make art. Um, but yeah, but I mean, if, if faced with a difference between a student who, you know, says, well, I've made some art, and if you don't get it, whatever, I don't care. <laughs> and a student who's like really thinking about, yeah, but did I, did I sort of meet your expectations? You know, it's a detective novel. So I need to kind of give you the, give you the clues when you're expecting them. Did I do that the right way? I think I'd probably rather work. I mean, in a way I'd rather, I'd rather kind of be in the conversation with the student who is really, is really concerned about what the reader needs and understanding that this is, you know, that I, I need to sort of anticipate readerly needs. I need to be able to sort of hail the reader and speak to the reader and deliver a story that the reader is, is able to interface with um, rather than write a sort of a, a kind of sense of such radical freedom that the reader doesn't matter. Um, so I think that's a great, a really great thing we, we should absolutely take from genre as much as as much as possible is that centrality of the reader um, being invited into the invited into the process. I think in your drafting process, at least I tell myself this, and I often counsel my students um, the same advice. Uh, for me, the first draft is for me. Um, mm -hmm. I have to have a draft that belongs to me in order to get readers out of that space so that I'm just committed to the page and I'm not blocked, I'm not worried, you know, I'm just there, you know, for me. And every subsequent draft then is for the reader. Um, and that's how I make my way to connecting with readers and, um, you know, getting that first draft down that is, you know, has some kind of emotional, you know, core and honesty that's coming, you know, from me and not from others' expectations, but others' expectations form the drafting process from then on out or needs or, you know, the connections you want to make. And of course, everyone's readership that they're trying to um, connect with is, is, is slightly different from another writer's concern, right? Um, and it's getting to be almost 8.30, so I'm going to take a couple more questions here um, and, and just kind of cherry pick from, there's so many good questions here, I wish we could get to them all. Um, but this is in sort of an outgrowth of what you both were just saying about relationship with the reader versus, um, you know, the, the writer's own, you know, I don't know what the writer wants to get out of it, right? And sometimes that's a journey, right? And so um, a, we've had a couple of questions along the lines of, does the genre literary split in any way keep authors from maybe doing their best work? And kind of a related um, question in a way, you know, in terms of how then the work is viewed, um, if a short story or novel does have genre elements mixed with literary elements, you know, how do you get an editor to actually look at them? Should you stick to one or the other until you are more established and can take those risks, you know? So 
I guess both those questions are asking, what's an author to do? Um, and you know, you know, how much um, weight and concern, you know, should you put to some of these issues? You know, maybe um, even before your career is 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 established. What would you say to that? Well, I have good news for this uh, questioner. Uh, and that is that you could be different people in different, you could be, you could have a different name uh, if you, you, if you write different books. Uh, and so you could try things. The point is you could actually try, you could write a, a romance or a whatever, any kind of genre book under a different name if you want and try to see how it goes for you, you know? Um, and there's something very liberating about that. I mean, the, the, the fiction in some ways starts with the, with the author, which is very, um, I don't know, I find that really exciting and, and interesting in its own right from like a storytelling perspective, but it's, but it's also just like a practical, you know, career type thing for someone who wants to become a writer. You can, you can just try it out, see how it feels. And, and there, there are a couple of there's a lot of romance authors today who started off completely, you know, incognito. This probably happens less these days than it used to, because uh, romance has become much more accepted in the mainstream. But it used to be that if you wanted to be, you know, there's actually a lot of academics who, uh, or a, a, I won't say a lot, there's a certain, a certain uh, demographic of academic like English professor who was secretly writing romances on the side. And some of them had, really were doing this like secretly because they didn't want it to hurt their career because at that point it really probably would. Um, but the point is you could still do that. Uh, so you have a certain freedom to, to explore genre um, on your own terms. Um, in terms of like, yeah, it, 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 if you're actually trying to get things published, it, these things are still pretty rigid, that's the truth. And you're, if you if you want to publish with a certain publisher, you just that you have to know what kind of stuff they publish. And if you want if you want to publish literary fiction, if you want to publish like a liter what they call literary fiction um, that has genre elements in it, then you have to really be clear that that's what you're doing, and that it's an experiment. And you're putting out that out front, and you have to be really clear about how your method a little bit. Um, you can't just drop the magical sword in the first paragraph like Christopher said. Um, but there is a way of doing that. And I do, and yes, to answer the question, I do think it helps if you're more established. So, so I think it's good to take like small steps in, in the different genres before you start breaking down the barriers. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I would just maybe just add that, you know, I think about <clears throat> writers like uh, Kelly Link or um, even a, you know, great short story writer like George Saunders, who, you know, will occasionally just uh, suddenly take a turn into a kind of some kind of wacky sci-fi dystopia or a story where everybody seems to be robots or um, one of my favorite stories of his just in the second half, he suddenly realized that the, the parents that the narrator keeps talking about being at home are actually ghosts. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think authors like that have over the last 10 or 15 years really I think I've done, done quite a bit to kind of massage the boundary so that it's not, um, it's, it's not so strict. And at least there's, I think there's much more of a, uh, a much more of a readiness to, um, at least for a, say a reader who's kind of looking for a kind of literary piece uh, to, to, not, to not be thrown <laughs> if, you know, if it suddenly turns out that there are ghosts or it suddenly turns out, um, <laughs> Right, that one of the characters thinks they're a vampire. Um, there's, there's, I think there really has been carved out, room carved out for the possibilities of that. And so I think, and much more acknowledgement that art, art is possible with those tools. Sometimes those are the perfect tools for making art. Um, mm -hmm. And there's not, there, I think there's some, there's less active exclusion or kind of, uh, kind of, you know, putting the story down at the first. At, at the first, uh, you know, mention of uh, of, of a werewolf, um, so so I, I think I think that's um, you know I think some good news too is that I, I think the trends are such that 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 is all opening up quite a bit, um, you know, and I think sometimes just even if you're if you're worried about these things, you know, I, I could imagine partly starting to look at where are places where you could have you would love to get published and what kind of things are they publishing? And you might find, you might find some place that seems super genre specific. And it might, it might mean that they would be a more kind of friendly reader for something you want to submit, but also look at what else they're publishing right now. Do you like what they publish? Is it good enough for your work to, to sit there alongside of it? Um, and if so, then it's, 
and then it's probably worth um, taking a shot on that venue. Um, or, you know, pick up a book of, you know, Best American Short Stories um, from last year and get to know it and sort of, and even there kind of get a sense of that as a kind of snapshot of a certain, a certain kind of literary landscape and take, take a tally of how many of those stories turn out to have a supernatural element or a fantastical element. Um, and you may be surprised at how many, of, how many of those stories are making use of those tools, but they are, they are recognized as works of art, so. Well, we're coming up on 8.30 here. And so do you have any parting thoughts um, for our attendees? Uh, you know, any, anything you'd like to add? Um, we had a question here about sort of, you know, maybe some advice about forming communities to, uh, you know, um, achieve the goal of not making these distinctions. You know, if you really wanted to, you know, if you really believe that, you know, genre and literary forms really are, or should be one in the same, and, you know, that's your goal, like, how do you make that a reality? What community can you form to kind of make that happen. I'm paraphrasing the question from the chat, but just um, as a send off, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, is fan fiction the way to go or is it? Uh... It could be, I mean, obviously like fan fiction and, and romance and other genres, romance, I'll speak with romance about romance. Uh, it's part of what's interesting about it to me or what was interesting about it to me is that it really is uh, so much of what's interesting about it. it is the community. Obviously it's a, a, an individual reading experience just like any reading of a novel, but in the end, a lot of it has to do with, with, with how these books actually help people structure communities and, and, and maintain those communities. And they really are community people who meet each other and, and, and are politically active together and things like that. They're really, there's a, there's a lot of activity within romance uh, on the commu community level, but obviously these communities are built around the books. Um, and uh, on recommendations for the books and on conversations around the books. Uh, so I think romance is definitely a really exciting place to do this. And, and there's so much happening in romance. There's like all these different subjects. It's so, again, because it's reader driven, there, you can really find exactly what you're interested in and find the people who are exactly interested in that. Um, and that could be a really interesting way of, of, of figuring out what it is you're, you yourself are interested in is sort of just like exploring the options that are really explicitly made uh, uh, sort of at, like a menu, menu style. Um, so I, I think romance is a great place to look if you're looking for community. Um, and again, because it's so varied, there, there's a good chance you'll find something that, that resonates. Yeah, that's great. Christopher, do you have any last words for us? I think my, um, you know, I just, uh, you know, uh, as a great fan of Frankenstein, <laughs> I, I often think of, uh, the, the otherwise fairly annoying Percy Shelley um, writing the preface for Mary Shelley's um, amazing novel, but you know he, he makes this really interesting point in the preface to Frankenstein where he, he says, essentially, this is, you know, this is no mere tale of supernatural terrors. Um, so it's really like right out the gate, he is trying to say, don't, don't read that, don't think this is just some crazy monster story. Um, and he goes on to say, it's what it's really about is it's about basically sort of putting people in such extreme circumstances that it gives you a chance to study human nature and to study human emotion um, by putting by putting these characters under so much pressure. Um, and I kind in some ways I kind of love that as a way of thinking about right what. What is the what is the point of a of a really good monster story? Well, it's ultimately it, it may be about sort of again just doing what any work of literary art does, and it's sort of thinking more about what humans are and how they behave and how they function and how they connect and disconnect from each other. Um, the flip side of that is you might also you know as with many things that Percy uh, said and did, um, he he's also kind of a jerk sometimes. And you might just want to say, well, but it's also just really, really fun as a really good monster story. Um, so I don't know, I'm, I'm just, I'm kind of leaving thinking about the, the <laughs> you know, the simultaneity of both the, the kind of the pure pleasure of, of the, the genre story um, 
that can nonetheless coexist with the ways in which the genre, the, the same tools are also in allowing us to kind of, you know, enter more deeply into uh, uh, the, the kind of storytelling that lets us think about human beings and how, who we are and how we operate. But, and otherwise I would just say, thank you so much, Laura, again, for inviting me to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Avi, for all your great insights, which I've, I've found incredibly useful. So I really appreciated doing this with both of you. Well, thank, yeah, thank you, you both. both. That, yeah. yeah, that was beautifully said, both of you, your parting words. And I've been taking notes uh, while you've been talking and I've learned so much from the both of you. And I just really so appreciate you taking the time to talk about this, um, this important topic. And thanks to everybody who joined us and stayed with us um, over our time. And um, it's just been a blast. So we'll see everyone again at the next webinar, probably next term, uh, we'll offer some good stuff. All right, good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks for joining. <laughs>